So thanks for having me. I'm really honored to be here all the way from Canada and from Montreal originally, so hence the accent. <laughs> Um, so I have a lot to cover. I wanted to do a bit of like a home reduction intro, quick intro, um, overview of the key in context, just to give you a sense of what we're working with. Then share three lessons learned and three reflections that I'm hoping will be helpful to you guys. So two definitions that I like of harm reduction are those two that are a bit different, but comes down to the same thing. So harm reduction refers to policies, programs and practices that aim primarily to reduce the adverse health, social, economic consequences of the use of drugs without necessarily reducing or stopping drug consumption. So what's the motivation behind harm reduction is not abstinence, it's not stopping drugs, it's actually reducing the harms. And it really values life, choice, respect and compassion over judgment, stigma, discrimination and punishment. So those are my two favorite definitions. Harm reduction historically has been grassroots and community focused. It's pragmatic, it's patient centered, it's ethical, it's non judgmental, it's evidence based. We have a ton of science on this, and Canada is a big producer of the science on this. It's been proven to work, it's cost efficient, it's cost saving, it's life saving, it's also a human right. So, for all these reasons, um, I think we should do harm reduction and do it to its full capacity, which I think you're not necessarily doing in Scotland. Um, so I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that today. <laughs> That's my job. So just to give you a sense of our key context, harm reduction made its way in the 90s into our national drug strategy. And we had a big overdose crisis in the 90s in, in Vancouver and came from that a four pillar approach that includes harm reduction as a central pillar. Um, unfortunately, we elected a very conservative government from 2006 to 2015. This was known as the Harper era, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with Stephen Harper, who led a government that became an active opponent of harm reduction on the national stage and then produced what was called then a national anti-drug strategy. So, <laughs> um, who we elect matters a lot when it comes to harm reduction. And so then we elected a liberal government that then reintroduced harm reduction, then it was applauded as this big progressive change. But you know, it really brought us back to basically where we were at in early 2000s. And then recently we had two um, political parties that voted a resolution unanim unanimously at their conventions to decriminalize drug use. And we have three cities right now that are calling for drug decriminalization. So that's just to give you a sense of where things stand. We opened the first in the supervised injection site in North America in 2003 in sight. I don't know if you've heard of it, it's fantastic. Uh, but it's also massive and it's not a model that's easily implemented in other settings. It has to date 3.6 million clients since opening, average 400 visits a day, and has intervened in more than 8,000 overdoses and there's never been a death. We have the first also not only the first supervised injection site in history in North America but also the first supervised injection service within a housing facility a care facility for people living with HIV so I think it's worth noting that the Dr. Peter Center actually opened in 2002 a supervised injection service that you see over there that's in the building but it operated for 12 years without an exemption meaning it operated illegally for 12 years without the government granting it an exemption and I'll clarify that in the next slide, but that's just to say that when you're doing the right thing, that's, that's great and nothing will happen to you. So I mean, our, and I'll share more examples later of people just taking the right steps independently of government granting an exemption or not and really um, siding on the right side of history. So our system in Canada is similar to here, I would say, maybe. It's different terminology, but we have a federal level. This is where an exemption would be granted for a supervised consumption room. But then we have the provincial level that is in charge of healthcare delivery. So you have these two levels working together. Um, so even though, let's say, a province would be really willing to implement a supervised injection service, they would need to go to the, the, the federal level to actually get an exemption so that the staff and the clients are not exposing themselves to potential criminal prosecutions. But like I said, the Dr. Peter Center and examples that I'll share later have functioned without an exemption and nothing has happened to the staff or the clients because we're in the midst of an overdose crisis. At the end of the day, we want to save lives and not just get caught in a bureaucratic <laughs> red tape. And so we've been doing a lot in terms of challenging the rules in Canada. 
So we have to get an exemption to open a supervised injection room or consumption room. Back in the Harper era, they made sure that it would be impossible to do that, so they established a piece of legislation that imposed 26 criteria that were really hard to meet. And since then, it has been changed to five criteria. So basically, to open a supervised injection room or a site or space, you have to meet these five criteria. And it's the Minister of Health that grants the exemption. So we're in the midst of an overdose crisis that has never been seen in the history of our country. Uh, last year alone, nearly 4,000 people died, and that's a 37% increase from the previous year. Um, in British Columbia, where I work, there's 100 people that die every month. And so this is where we're standing right now. Who's dying? It's mostly men and mostly fairly young. Um, mostly related to fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, and I'll share some of that later as well, involving other substances and almost all of them indoors. So despite all the supervised injection services that we have, and I'll share how much like, that has evolved over the years, people are still dying indoors quite a bit. And just kind of a link to <laughs> your crisis here, um, it pretty is scary uh, because for me coming from Canada seeing this I can guarantee you that these numbers won't go down so if you can learn something from us please act now because in two three years you'll just see these numbers grow and grow and grow and people keep dying and dying and dying this crisis won't go anywhere um, so you need concrete solutions now uh, and just to give you a sense, you're at 934 overdose deaths last year, and BC declared a public health emergency when it was about to reach 800 deaths. And so my understanding is that you don't have a public health emergency declared right now, but you should. Um, so that's a comparison maybe that might be helpful for you. Lesson learned. Is that good? Is my pace good? Yeah? Not bad? <laughs> I'm trying to, like, I don't want to, like, go over my time. Um, overdose deaths are preventable, um, they are, and we're in a particular situation in Canada because we have a toxic drug supply, and I'll touch on that at the very end, but they are preventable, and Overdose Prevention 101 is fairly easy. Number one, don't use alone. But if people don't have a place to go, they will use alone. And if they're fearful of being arrested, they will use alone. And so you have to build these spaces to make sure they don't use alone. People need to take their time. Rushing is known to be a big risk factor for overdosing, but for that, they need to be in a safe space. If they don't have a safe space, they will rush. Uh, ideally, test your drugs. It could be a drug testing service like we have in Canada, but it could also just be like doing a test shot just to see how strong your product is, uh, your drug is. Carrying naloxone, that's also a step, but it's not enough to really be effective at preventing overdose deaths. So you have to do all the things that I'm listing here. And it needs to be wide distribution. So in Canada, what we've learned is that you have to rethink all the frontline groups <coughs> as including like bartenders and librarians and people that work in school and people who work in prisons. And you really need to like really go wide and not just restrict it to people who use drugs or the usual suspects, you know. Um, people need access to first aid, including oxygen, because we've seen a lot of people with brain damage because of failure to provide really good ventilation and oxygenation when they overdose. And people need to be encouraged to call 911, or I'm, I'm being told here it's 999, but people need to not be fearful of doing that. And if they are fearful, they won't call and people will die. And in Canada, we introduced the Good Samaritan Law to make sure that people who call 999 are not gonna be prosecuted if there are drugs that are found on the premises. Um, and that really hasn't resulted in big changes, but we're moving in that direction. So we have, uh, I would say, this is what I, <laughs> these are my pictures, and I did a little pyramid just to show you that we have very basic overdose prevention sites in Canada that are supervised consumption spaces, but are very basic, so they only provide first aid, overdose first aid, and are usually run with volunteers and peers. Um, and it can be very basic, and I can show you an example later. Then you can go up and become a little bit more complex with a healthcare and social delivery format, like Insight, and then you go up at the top of the pyramid where you actually have Crosstown Clinic where we deliver prescription heroin in addition to supervised injection services. So this is the map of the number of supervised um, consumption spaces that are in the country. 
it just gives you a sense of a pretty big expansion over the past two years. So these are overdose prevention sites and I wanted to share that with you because that's something that in Europe has not been implemented really, it's a key concept and it happened back in 2016 when BC declared a public health emergency. The first one was just outdoors, it was just a tent that was popped, in a, popped up in an alley. Um, and what happened is that over the course of the fall 2016, um, the Ministry of Health just realized how bad this crisis was gonna be and issued a ministerial order saying that all over those prevention sites that are gonna open in that province would just be legitimate and no one would be prosecuted. So they don't have an exemption still to this day, but they've been operating. And just to give you a sense of the number of visits, <laughs> that's just the number of visits for one year for one site. It's like above 100,000 visits. Uh, 255 overdoses, no deaths. And these are two, one is in a shipping container, one is indoor in a not-for-profit organization, but just so it shows you the range of what you can do with a very simple model. In Ontario, we did the same thing. I was part of uh, one that was organized in the city of Ottawa, and the Ontario province implemented a program to fund these overdose prevention sites, but recently elected what I would describe as <laughs> a mini Trump <laughs> and for the next four years we're going to be stuck with him. He's very anti-harm reduction and because of that that program has been closed. So I would say again elections really matter. So this was our overdose prevention site. It doesn't get more simple than that. I don't know if you agree, it's pretty basic, but it works extremely well. This was the last day when we closed. We were forced to close because of the weather and the lack of support um, at the local level, but we were still running the overdose prevention site. These are our numbers. We got close to 4,000 visits in 80 days of running a service for three hours every day with volunteers, no staff paid. And why do they work? Well, it's basically going back to overdose prevention 101. It's quick to implement, it's peer driven, operates outside heavy bureaucratic structures, there's no barriers, and it's, you also are allowed to do a bit more things, like people are able to split their drugs, so use with a friend, they're able to assist each other, stuff that you can't do in a supervised injection service in Canada. So supervised consumption sites in general, we know so much about them now. We're at a stage where there's so much research on this topic that people are starting to do systematic reviews, so meaning combining the science. So we're really not at the experimental stage, we're not at the pilot project stage, we're at the rapid implementation, this is routine stage. <laughs> so I don't wanna go through the list, but basically from everything from like condom use going up to chances of accessing treatment, going into treatment, going up. At Insight, for example, people are more likely, 30% to 35% more likely to access treatment if they go use that Insight than if they don't. Um, from soft tissue infections, from wound care, Basically, there are so many benefits from a health, but also public safety um, aspect. And when you look at, for example, Australia, that's been running supervised injection services for a long time, there's been no increase in crime. Um, so that shouldn't be really a concern because it's never been demonstrated that this is actually related to an increase in crime whatsoever. And I think the one thing that we need to remember is that there's been zero deaths. There's more than 130 supervised consumption sites across the globe, and no one is dying. So if you want to impact um, your numbers, you need to do this like yesterday. Uh, harm reduction is standard of care. Um, it's not limited to drugs. We use harm reduction for all sorts of things like diet and smoking and alcohol. <laughs> it's not limited to a particular space. We do it in hospital and community and clinics. Uh, it's not limited to a population. We do it with children. We do it with teenagers. We do it with young adults. and adults and elderly people, but when it comes to drugs, for some reason, we have a hard time doing it. And I would challenge everyone in this room to start thinking about harm reduction as standard of care and not this exceptional thing that we do for people who use drugs, because we do it all the time, and when we do it with all these other population in these other settings, we're fine with it. And then when it comes to drugs, like, ooh, now there's a problem. Because basically right now, we're funding all these programs, um, we're doing some specific population specific programs, we're decreasing the harms, but when it comes to drugs, it's the only population I would say that doesn't have full access to harm reduction like the other populations, because if they did, um, actually they could access safer drugs if we did harm reduction for real for this population. They could test their drugs, they could access supplies, uh, they could access supervised consumption services, 
Um, they could use with peers in supportive housing facilities, they could get help to inject, they could access supplies when they're admitted to the hospital, when they're in prison, and they could receive the care and support that they need. And that's not what we're seeing right now. And harm reduction is not enough. <laughs> so one thing that I can share from Canada is that we need as much attention to harm reduction as treatment. They need to go hand in hand. You can't be pro-treatment and against harm reduction. You can't be against harm reduction and, um, uh, how am I, anyway, vice versa, uh, because they need to go hand in hand. And you also have to have a harm reduction approach to treatment. So abstinence-based treatments don't work for a lot of people. So you need to offer multiple options to people so that it meets their needs and not your goals as a providers. Um, access to treatment is imperative, but not any kind of treatment. In Canada, we have a big issue around treatment right now. It's really long to long wait times. Uh, that's unacceptable. So people should be able to start treatment when they're ready on the day of. Uh, it needs to be regulated. This is an issue that we have, is that we have all these unregulated treatment programs that are usually for profit. So treatment should not be for profit should be evidence-based and low barrier, include peers, uh, also include a housing component and transition time so that you don't move from treatment to nothing. So far, so good? Okay, reflections. <laughs> it's really hard to do harm reduction in a harm-inducing context. Um, so what I mean by harm-inducing context, context is when you have all these policies into place that are harmful to people, and at the same time you're trying to reduce harm. So it's really counterproductive. Um, so in that harm-reducing context where we criminalize people who use drugs, it's not very conducive to harm reduction. It actually creates a lot of barriers to care and services. It's very stigmatizing, it creates discrimination. It's often grounded in racism and oppression, and it leads to poor health and socioeconomic outcomes. And even though BC is a champion in harm reduction, I just shared the outcomes of a very recent report that in 2016, 73% of all the drug arrests in BC were related to drug, to drug possession. So at the same time, we're sending the message like, please come use in our supervised injection services. Please start treatment. We have all these things for you. You can test your drugs, you can access supplies, you can access naloxone, but we're gonna put you in jail consistently for drug possession and harm you consistently and then create additional barriers for you to access a job and housing to stay with your children, especially if you're an indigenous woman. Um, so all these things are really problematic right now. And one figure that I really like is this figure. I don't know if you've seen it before. Maybe it's old for some people in this room. But at the same time as legalizing and promoting drugs is really harmful, right? You don't want to be like, hey, everybody, like, let's use heroin. It's so, you know, at the end of the day, you've had a hard day. Like, let's just sh shoot up, you know? Like, you don't want to be promoting drugs because that would be harmful in the same way that we don't promote alcohol and tobacco. We're not supposed to, but anyway, you know? <laughs> Uh, but at the same time, prohibition is extremely harmful as well. So the goal should be to try to move towards the middle where we have a public health approach to drugs um, and create a less harmful context to work in. An example of how difficult it is to do this work in this context in Canada right now is because we created that Good Samaritan law, uh, but people still don't want to call 999 because they still feel fearful of the police and still are fearful of being arrested. So even though we have this very proactive harm reduction based piece of legislation, on the ground it has created very little to no impact because people are still so fearful of calling 999. So again, great piece of legislation, but very harmful context to do this work in. So it hasn't really created the impact that we were hoping for. Oh. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share based on our what's happening in our country is that we have a toxic drug supply. So we basically um, have a poison drug supply and people are getting poisoned. And a lot of people are trying to push a change in language to say that this is a, actually a poisoning emergency where um, it basically would be the equivalent of like uh, water being poisoned and people dying and instead of addressing the poisoned water we keep like giving them antidotes to the poisoning <laughs> and it just keeps going and going in circle it's a vicious cycle and we're, there's no way out of it unless we address the, to uh, the toxic drug supplies and i just had included a coroner report table that shows how the percentage of overdoses in the province of Ontario that are related to fentanyl. And I can just show you this image of all well, this table where you see British Columbia, 84% of the overdoses, overdose deaths are related to fentanyl. And if you're not familiar with fentanyl, it is a very, very potent opiate. 
Um, right now in British Columbia, there is no heroin available. So if you know, uh, and I'm saying this like really seriously, if you know anyone who's traveling to Canada right now, you need to let them know at this because they will die. And that has happened to a colleague of ours, um, went to a meeting, very strong leader in the community, had been a fentanyl chronic user for years and years and years, knew uh, how to use it safely, and he died at the meeting in his hotel room. So it is a toxic drug supply, there's no way out of it, there's no naloxone that will save us from this crisis until we provide people with safer drugs. This will continue and we're seeing it because right now 100 people are dying every month despite all the harm reduction services being put into place. Um, so that's why it's important to understand the, the link with prohibition, the fact that it's driving this unregulated market and unregulated substances, you never know what you're buying. Um, and it used to be the case for alcohol in the, you know, back in the prohibition time that people would drink alcohol and die because they didn't know what they were drinking, they didn't know the amount of alcohol that they were ingesting and they would die. Um, and so it's the same thing, we have an unregulated market and just people will continue to die until we provide them with safer substances. The third thing that I really want to emphasize, if you can learn something from us, is the solution is not to create what we call in Canada an opioid chill, where everyone's freaking out about opiates, especially physicians or nurse prescribers, and are just suddenly unwilling to prescribe opiates, thinking that if we restrict, and government also enacting some policies around restriction and monitoring, and making everyone scared to prescribe opiates, is really not the way to go. What we're seeing in Canada right now is actually the effects of these really harmful policies, is that it's driving people that used to be treated with for example, for pain on opiates, and physicians are now so scared to prescribe opiates that they're saying, actually, I'm not gonna prescribe you opiates anymore. Uh, we're gonna switch you on some, I don't know, ibuprofen or whatever, or I'm gonna stop prescribing altogether. You need to get off these medications because I'm gonna be watched and reported to my professional regulatory body. So everyone being so scared, and those patients, pain patients being turned to the street um, to buy illicit drugs to meet their pain needs because they're in pain. And so what we're seeing is actually people that have never taken illicit drugs in their whole life turning to the street and dying of overdoses and also like also using unregulated products, really substances for dealing with their pain when they should be treated properly by physicians. So regulatory bodies are starting to address that by saying like uh, you cannot just remove someone, <laughs> remove the treatment from someone, you need to really have a strong plan and, and you can't cut someone from you know, opiates like, just like that because you're scared. Um, and so that's what's happening and I would say the tendency has been that governments come up with solutions um, that are often not based on consultation with the um, target population. So if you want to really understand what you should be doing to address this crisis, you need to talk to the people most affected by the crisis the people that are at the front line, the peers that are doing the work out there, people who use drugs, and listen to them, and listen when they warn you that a policy is gonna be harmful to them, because they know. And in Canada, we have a history of not listening, not listening, and every time there's been a major shift in policy, people who use drugs in the country have been saying, please don't do this, this is gonna be horrible, please listen to us, the solution is ABC and governments are like no because you know you're not a credible source of knowledge you know there's a lot of stigma you're not experts we're going to talk to the public health experts and the researchers out there and then they come up with these really harmful policies so please don't do this here um, I think you have a chance to act and you should act as quickly as possible this crisis I, I can guarantee you that it's not going to improve um, and I hope that in a few years maybe this event will have changed the course of your overdose crisis here uh, because you really don't have the luxury of time. Um, and the conclusion is those lessons, learns, and reflections I'm hoping can shape the discussions throughout the day and really shape your policy um, decisions and programs that you implement. And I would say that as long, that would be my conclusion, that as long as we criminalize drugs and people use them, harm reduction will not work to its full potential. Uh, the fact that we treat people who use drugs as criminals is the biggest barrier to prevention, biggest barrier to care, biggest barrier to life-saving services, driver of harms at the physical, mental, economic, social levels, and the big driver of this crisis right now. So we also need to examine how to shift our thinking around drugs more generally and maybe follow in Portugal's footsteps in terms of decriminalizing. I think this is where Canada is heading next.
So I can, before I leave, I'll leave the contact um, slide up if there's any questions, but I just want to share that if you're interested in overdose prevention sites, there are guides out there on how to do this. Um, so I can send that to you if you want. Uh, there are also guidance on how to implement supervised consumption spaces that are coming out of Canada that are really helpful. And there are also um, systemic, systematic reviews that are, have been published on this that I think people should know that exists and really base your decisions on the science and not ideology or morality. Mm -hmm.